هنبتدي النهاردة السيشن الأولانية وحتكون موضوعها Handling Pre-Operative Medication in the Pre-Operative Period واللي هتقوم بالمحاضرة الدكتورة عبير أحمد وهي الحقيقة من الناس النشطين والمخلصين للعلم ويعني إن شاء الله نتمتع بالمحاضرة بتاعتها تفضلي يا عبير Good morning. Uh, my talk is going to be about handling of preoperative medication in the perioperative uh, period. And actually, this is not considered as the title of a lecture. I think this is the daily practice uh, of all anesthesiologists. If you ask ourselves why this topic, we may give the answer that at least 50% of surgical patients take medication on a regular basis. Routinely used medications have many potential interactions with drugs used during anesthesia, and many medications must be continued and resumed immediately after the recovery. Others must be stopped, others must be replaced, and sometimes temporary administration of another route is advised. Sometimes additional monitoring of patient or plasma drug concentration may be required. Unfortunately, there is few outcome data about the majority of medication taken in the perioperative period. And this lack of, of medical evidence is reflected by wide and large variation in perioperative management recommendations. So the objective of this talk will be to display the most recent evidence guideline and or expert consensus recommendation, especially uh, with the commonly used medication in form of drugs for cardiovascular system, drugs affecting hemostasis, drugs affecting the endocrinal system and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If we start with the drugs affecting the cardiovascular system and it started with the most commonly used one of them which is the beta blocker. Beta blocker is usually prescribed for patients with ischemic heart disease, hypertension and or arrhythmias. Beta blockers have potential adverse effect in form of bradycardia and hypotension. And as we all know, acute withdrawal in the pre or post operative period of such medication lead to substantial morbidity and even mortality. If we search for the most recent uh, guidelines uh, dealing with the cardiovascular medication, we can use the American Colleague of Cardiology and American Heart Association perioperative guidelines regarding this issue. And this recommend, these uh, uh, guidelines state that beta blockers should be continued in patients undergoing surgery who have been on beta blocker chronically. And it is reasonable for management of beta blocker after surgery to be guided by the clinical circumstances of such patients, like hypotension, bradycardia, or bleeding. This means that the patient should be closely monitored in the post-operative period. And this is independent on the when the agent was started. This requires some sort of fine-tuning of beta blockers. For example, some oral medications should be replaced by IV ones. Chronically used the non-selective beta blockers must not be replaced with selective ones. If we have a patient who is target or recommended to have beta blockers in the uh, uh, in his regular medication it is not recommended at all to start it one day less than one day before a surgical procedure because it is going to be harmful and the starting uh, it is recommended to start beta blocker and we have some other studies not that big few studies recommending the use of beta blockers at least 30 days before surgery to get its benefit this is the beta blockers. One of the other, uh, uh, one of the most commonly used drug in patients with cardiovascular system is statins. And like beta blockers, statins should be continued in patients currently taking statins and scheduled for non-cardiac surgery. But unlike beta blockers, perioperative initiation of statins is reasonable in patients, especially who are undergoing vascular procedures. The alpha-2 agonist like clonidine was previously thought that peri use of a small dose uh, uh, of clonidine or any of uh, alpha-2 agonists may have good out uh, outcome for surgical patients. 
But this concept is no more nowadays because of large studies found that the preoperative initiation of low-dose clonidine or alpha agonists result in increased harm of hypotension and non-fatal cardiac arrest. In addition, that abrupt withdrawal of such medication may lead to repound hypertension. So it is recommended now that initiation of alpha-2 agonists for prevention of cardiac events is not recommended in patients who are undergoing non-cardiac surgery. But given the possible negative consequences of withdrawal, it is recommended that alpha-2 agonists must be continued in the perioperative period, but not initiated. Regarding the calcium channel blockers, the data are limited regarding this issue, and the withdrawal sy uh, symptoms are not typically found in calcium channel blockers. And abrupt discontinuation of these drugs has been reported to cause severe vasospasm in patients who are undergoing coronary revascularization. The American College of Cardiologists and American Heart Association latest guidelines said no clear recommendation about calcium channel blockers. But consensus that calcium channel blocker must be continued in patients already taking them is uh, recommended, but not initiated. Regarding the ACE inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blockers, the same data regarding these medications are inconsistent. Most studies indicate that some increase in the risk of perioperative hypotension episode with little or no significant effort at adverse effect of cardiovascular a system when the medication are continued. That's why the recommendation of the American College of Cardiologists and American Heart Association that such medication must be continued uh, if they are used in the preoperative period. And if ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker are held in the preoperative period, it is reasonable to be restarted as soon as clinically feasible. All, we, all of us are dealing with diuretics, and theoretically, there are concerns about hypokalemia and hypovolemia. Concern regarding the hypotension during induction of anesthesia due to systemic vasodilator effect of the anesthetic agent in hypovolemic patients. That's why it is recommended to help the morning dose uh, of the uh, 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 diuretics in the morning of the surgery and to be resumed when the patient, the patient starts his oral feeding. This is simply the most of the drugs that are used for cardiovascular system. Now we come to the medication that affect the hemostasis and we may start with the antiplatelet therapy. Antiplatelet therapy has major role in prevention and management of cardiac and vascular events. The perioperative management of antiplatelet agent is a complex issue, and in, it must be in form of cooperation between surgeon, anesthesiologist, and cardiologist. Several factors should be considered before decision to continue or to stop antiplatelet therapy. An important factor that must be taken in consideration is the initial indication of the antiplatelet therapy. But the most important is what are the consequences of stopping such a drug before operation. And if you try to remember the role of the platelets in initiation of coagulation system, activated platelets, which are going to be activated when there is vascular injury, so endothelial injury on endothelial pathology, through activation of the platelet uh, glycoprotein receptor by the co uh, endothelial collagen, leading to release of a lot of mediators, including thromboxan A2, thrombin, and ADB or adenosine diphosphate. According to this physiological basis, we have the following antiplatelet medications. Thromboxan E2 inhibitors or aspirin, the ADB receptor antagonists like uh, uh, clobidogrel and uh, teclobidine, and uh, glycoprotein receptor inhibitor like agrostat. Regarding the aspirin, aspirin may be used for primary prevention for those at high risk of thrombus formation or may be used for secondary pre prevention of patients with unstable or stable angina or acute coronary syndrome, or it may be used as a part of DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy. Regarding the aspirin, we have very recent publication in the BGA. Give us a diagram how to deal with aspirin in the perioperative period. It depends on the cause of the uh, aspirin in, uh, medication. If it is for primary prevention, it is recommended to be stopped seven to 10 days preoperative. 
but if it is used for secondary prevention, we have to look to what extent the surgical procedure is bloody. If we have high risk, uh, high risk of bleeding, it is recommended to stop aspirin uh, seven to 10 days before surgery. But if, we, if it is, there is no risk of bleeding, we may continue the procedure. The other type of antiplatelet therapy are ADB receptor antagonists, adenosine diphosphate receptor antagonists, which I may be used as the treatment for vascular uh, events like thrombo, uh, cardio, uh, cerebrovascular stroke, and the duration of surgery usually ranges from three to six months, or as a part of TAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy for coronary artery disease. And here we have to mention that the premature discontinuation of DAPT therapy in patients with coronary artery disease before the recommended interval necessary for complete endothelialization of the stent can lead to fatal consequences. And here we may go back to such intervals, which are in form of two weeks for percutaneous transluminal uh, coronary angioplasty, four to six weeks in case of myocardial infarction, six weeks in case of bare metal stent, bare metal stent and six to 12 months, months in case of blood drug eluting stents. And if you go back to the same diagram provided by the BGA regarding how to manage the uh, DAPT medication in the perioperative period, it depends in, uh, on to what extent the patient is at risk of um, thrombus formation if the medication is discontinued. If the patient did not fulfill the required interval, he is going to be considered as high risk. And here we have to look for the type of the surgery. In case of emergency procedures, we have to continue the treatment. We have no choices. And in case of elective surgery, we have to postpone the surgery until the, the, the recommended interval passes. On the other hand, if we have an urgent procedure that must be performed within 24 to 48 hours, it depends on the risk of bleeding. In case of low risk of bleeding, we have to continue the medication. In case of intermediate risk of bleeding, we have to stop that and continue the aspirin. In case of high risk of bleeding, we have to stop the uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and we think about bridging therapy, and this will be discussed later. Let's have a look on the other medication that affecting the hemostasis, the hemostatic system, uh, which is anticoagulants. And as we remember that we have two pathways for coagulation system, which is intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway, that meet each other in the common pathway, converting prothrombin into thrombin and fibrinogen into fibrin. And back to the physiology, we may have the following anticoagulant therapy. But um, vitamin K antagonist in form of warfarin, the new oral anticoagulants, which is direct factor 10 inhibitor, uh, direct thrombin inhibitor, and heparin family, either unfractionated heparins or low molecular weight heparins. Anticoagulant therapy are frequently prescribed as prolonged therapy for treatment of AF, mechanical heart valves, venous or arterial thromboembolism, ventricular assisted device. At any given year, 15 to 20% of patients on oral anticoagulants will undergo an invasive procedure or surgery that interrupts the chronic use of oral anticoagulants, putting these patients at risk of either thromboembolism, hemorrhage, or even death, cre creating a clinical dilemma. Actually, this clinical dilemma has lack of evidence to guide the medical decision. But among all associations that are concerning with anticoagulant therapy, for example, the American Colleague of Cardiologists, the American Heart Association, all agree on three principles in managing the perioperative anticoagulant therapy. The first principle is, with low bleeding risk, oral anticoagulant should not be interrupted. With high risk of the bleeding, oral anticoagulant, high, with high risk of bleeding and high risk of thromboembolic manifestation, we have to consider the process of bridging. In case of intermediate uh, risk cases, the decision must be individualized according to each patient and according to their circumstances. So the optimal uh, perioperative anticoagulation management can be uh, passed as follow. First of all, we have to confirm the indication of the oral anticoagulants, for example, if you have a patient receiving oral anticoagulants for the treatment of DVT for more than six months, 
actually there is no more need for all our anticoagulants for this type of patient it must be discontinued safely otherwise if the patient is a candidate for oral anticoagulants we have to assess the risk of bleeding versus the risk of thromboembolism in case with in case of having low risk of bleeding but high risk of thromboembolism we have to avoid oral anticoagulants interruption and several studies reveal that continuous warfarin therapy can paradoxically pre pre uh, reduce the perioperative bleeding relative to the interrupted warfarin with heparin bridging, especially if we kept the INR at the low therapeutic level of two. On contrary, warfarin interruption and reinitiation can be associated with increased incidence of early postoperative stroke. This paradox may be due to early depletion of vitamin K dependent factors, protein S, protein C, creating hypercoagulable state, and this is referred to as repound hypercoagulability. In case of having high risk of bleeding and high risk of thromboembolism, it is recommended to interrupt the oral anticoagulant therapy and start bridging. Oral anticoagulants mean administration of short-acting anticoagulants, typically heparins, during the interruption of longer anticoagulants, typically warfarin. And this is aimed to minimize the time at which patient is not anticoagulated and thereby minimize the risk of perioperative thromboembolism. Bridging initiation must be started preoperatively by stopping warfarin five days before surgery, depending on its plasma half-life. And start the three days before surgery, we have to start the, or, uh, the, uh, the, non, um, uh, the heparin. And we have to follow the uh, INR daily. We have to stop bridging uh, therapy for hours for, uh, for unfractionated heparins and the 12 hours for low molecular weight heparins before surgery. In the post-operative period, Resumption of, pre of bridging therapy should be delayed until there is adequate hemostasis based on the clinical assessment of the wound and the drains, and usually it takes about 12, 24 to 72 hours. Warfarin must be resumed on the same post-operative day as heparin, and heparin can be discontinued when the INR reaches the therapeutic level 2 to 3. Here is the third case <clears throat> when we have low risk of thromboembolism but high risk of bleeding. Here we can interrupt the oral anticoagulants without bridging. Yes, we can. We can interrupt oral anticoagulants without the need of bridging. And this technique is supported by several trials. One of them is bridge trial, bridging anticoagulation in patients who require temporary interruption of free and therapy for elective invasive procedures. This is non-inferiority surgery, and the study confirms that no bridging is no inferior to bridging for pre prevention of thromboembolism, and it is superior for reduction of bleeding. When we are in need of urgent reversal of our free therapy, it is recommended to use vitamin K. Vitamin K depends on the route of administration. 1 to 2 mg can hasten normalization of INR within 12 hours if given IV and 24 hours when given oral. For emergency procedure, vitamin K of higher doses, 2 to 20 mg, should be considered in case of active bleeding or when we are uh, having very high level of INR. Blood components should be considered in form of prothrombin complex concentrate fresh frozen plasma. And we have to mention that for neuroaxial blockade, we have to follow the evidence-based guideline for American Society of Regional Anesthesia that uh, uh, recommend for prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparins, a spinal and epidural catheter can be placed 12, 10 to 12 hours after the last dose of low molecular weight heparin. And after the surgery, when there is adequate surgical hemostasis, we may wait for six to eight hours before catheter removal and resumption of low molecular weight medication. In case of therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin, spinal or epidural catheter can be placed 10 to 12 hours after the last dose of low molecular, um, I'm sorry, 24 hours after the last dose 
no, no, 10 to 12 hours after last dose of low molecular weight heparin, and it can be removed safely 24 hours after removal of, uh, after the uh, uh, catheter removal, and it can be resumed uh, in, uh, safely after. Now we may pass to the other type of medication that are affecting the endocrine system, and we will concentrate on the patient receiving uh, medication for uh, blood glucose and steroid therapy. The perioperative medical handling, handling of diabetic patients, patients with diabetes are exposed to increased risk of perioperative morbidity and mortality, and the perioperative guidelines for diabetes are a combination of some evidence-based recommendations and many expert consensus. The primary goal of perioperative management is to avoid a stroke and to keep the blood glucose level between 100 to 200 milligram per deciliter. And these are the guidelines of the Australian Society of Diabetes in 2012 and the American Diabetes Association guidelines in 2015. The day before surgery, we have how, to, how can we deal with the patient with diabetes? In the day before surgery, patients who require insulin therapy, either type 1 and type 2, the decision must be guided by the preoperative uh, glycemic control, the insulin regimen, the type of the surgery, the time of the surgery, and the resumption of patient usual diet. And we have to know that the minor surgical procedure here is defined as day case surgery, in which the patient is able to resume his oral feeding in the same day and may leave the hospital. In this condition, we have to differentiate between major and minor procedures. In case of major surgery and when the patient is scheduled to, to be in the morning list, the evening dose must be continued, take the usual dose of short-acting insulin, or reduce the 20% inter, uh, of intermediate or long-acting dose. The morning dose must be omitted. If the patient is scheduled to be in the afternoon, afternoon list, the patient must be admitted in hospital at proper time. Blood glucose level must be followed in the preoperative world, and we have to give 50% of the morning dose of insulin before an early breakfast. Then fasting can be started. In case of minor surgical procedure and the patient is scheduled to be in the morning last, we may delay the usual morning dose. Uh, if the patient can eat early, then he can take the breakfast after the usual insulin dose. And of course, if the blood, blood glucose must be monitored, and if it is more than 20 milligram per deciliter, insulin glucose infusion is recommended. If we have this patient to be scheduled in the afternoon list, it is advised to adjust this patient similar to that of major surgical procedure. Blood glucose infusion may be used in the perioperative uh, period according to the monitoring of uh, blood glucose level. Patients who uh, require oral hypoglycemic uh, medication, they must stop oral medication in the morning of the surgery. And they must be started immediately after they are able to resume their oral feeding. Uh, insulin glucose infusion must be considered if the blood glucose level exceeds 2 milligram, 200 milligram per deciliter, or if the base of the surgical procedure is going to be prolonged or complicated. And here we have or in the patient who used more than one uh, anticoagulant therapy in, its, in his preoperative period. For all patients either receiving insulin or oral anticoagulants, maintenance of glycemic control requires measuring of the blood glucose level every one to two hours. Use subcutaneous insulin to control blood glucose during short surgery or IV insulin if longer procedures are present. Infusion rate uh, can be calculated by dividing the blood glucose level by 10 and initiation of infusion. We have to keep an eye on the level of the potassium. And we have to maintain the proper hydration of the patient through continuous intravenous infusion of fluid without dextrose. And we have to consider insulin glucose infusion uh, to uh, when I. Uh, in, sorry, if insulin infusion is required, uh, we should start it in a separate IV line, provided adequate substrate after achievement of the specific glycemic goal. 
And here we have to follow the sliding scale of glucose regimen. In case of patient receiving uh, steroid therapy, stress dose is needed only when hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is expected to be suppressed. The time of recovery of the normal adrenal function after a stop corticosteroid varies from a few days to several months. However, generally, cortisol level uh, return to baseline within 24 to 74 hours after the procedures. Here is the guidelines of how can we manage the patient or oral anticoagulants depending on the perioperative regimen of uh, steroid. In those patients receiving less than 10 mg per day, we may assume that they have normal uh, hypothalamic perfusion uh, uh, pituitary axis and there is no need of additional steroid or cover. In case of patients receiving more than milligram per deciliter and they are subjected to minor surgical procedure, 25 milligram hydrocortisone at induction is enough and we have to resume the regular dose of its uh, medication immediately post-operative. In case of major surgical procedure, we have to continue the usual preoperative steroid doses. Then, in the, in the intraoperative period, we may use from, 100 to, from 25 to 100 milligram at induction of general anesthesia and to continue 100 milligram per day for 24 hours and rapidly resuming the regular dose of uh, steroid. In case of major surgical procedure, the patient should continue his preoperative steroid medication and in the intraoperative period, 25 mg per uh, cortisone at induction followed by, 10, uh, follow, followed by 100 mg per day for 24 to 72 hours associated with resumption of regular uh, dose of uh, steroid once it is available. Regarding the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are very commonly used medication in the perioperative period, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit platelet uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme, block the formation of thromboxane A2. Unlike aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit cyclooxygenase in reversible way. So, despite having conflict data about the uh, use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in the perioperative period, but there is consensus that discontinuation of these drugs two or three days before uh, surgery is accepted. Backing to the Anesthesiology Journal in 2017, we have here this review article discussing the perioperative medication to know when to hold and when to fold. Actually, we have uh, plenty of medication that must be. Uh, uh, that we may deal with. But we focus in this lecture on the most commonly used ones. So coming back, or we may go back to this article to check the rest of the tracks.